My guest today is a lawyer, an activist, and a brand new Israeli. One of the UK's finest and most celebrated legal minds, Mark Lewis. Mark, together with his fiancée, Mandy Blumenthal, moved to Israel at the end of 2018. And once you've been in his company, you'll never forget him. Mark represented more than 120 victims of phone hacking and exposed the news of the world's role in the scandal. When specialist hacker Glenn Mulcair and royal reporter Clive Goodman were both charged in 2006, Mark noticed what others had missed. Although the charges related mostly to youngsters of the royal family, Mark was concerned that Mulcair's wider targets included five others among them, chairman of the PFA, the Professional Footballers Association, Gordon Taylor. I saw the news and I thought, they've hacked Gordon to get that story. He calls it his light bulb moment. And so Mark exposed the full scale of criminality inside Murdoch's paper and then later inside the Mirror Group. He represented scores of victims, among them the family of murdered schoolgirl Millie Dowler, the biggest case of them all. And that led to the closure of the News of the World and the jailing of Andy Coulson. Payments to the Dowler family totaled £3 million. On a personal note, he defended me in 2018 when I was libelled by, among others, the FT and The Sun over the infamous President's Club story. He secured for me a five-figure settlement in what seemed effortless ease. His opponents, hearing it was him on the other end of the phone or on email, stepped aside, agreed terms and settled quickly. In the midst of the immediate brouhaha, it was amazing to have this calm operator in the midst of a storm. Mark grew up in suburban Manchester. He has four children from his first wife. And at one point, he also had a collection of vintage cars, among them a 1903 de Dion Bouton, which once reputedly belonged to Bridget Bardot. Mark has multiple sclerosis. His right arm and leg have lost their power. It was first diagnosed when he was in his 20s. I can honestly tell you, though, it's not the first thing you notice about him. He's six foot three, robust of stature. He took part in a groundbreaking clinical trial at Israel's Hadassah Hospital that offers treatment which could finally secure a cure for the two and a half million sufferers worldwide of MS. Mark was one of 48 patients to take part in the revolutionary year-long trial in Jerusalem, one of the first times stem cells have been used in neurological cases. At the Israeli hospital, Mark was injected with those stem cells derived from his own bone marrow, directly into the spinal fluid. Now, he said he benefited immediately afterwards from a miraculous 60% improvement in his condition. Within minutes, he got feeling back and movement that he'd not felt for years. The Herzl quote they speak about a lot in Israel sums it up, he said. If you will it, it is no dream. Mark says the pioneering trials proved the complete antithesis to BDS, Israeli technology treating everybody with a team that has no concept of religion or nationality. The lead professor was born in Greece. He's Christian. He's now an Israeli citizen. There was a Muslim doctor. There was someone from the former Soviet Union. And there was a specialist who's the sister of someone to be known as an Israeli settler. But all Mark noticed was a real sense of everybody pulling together to try to crack it. Having heard about the trial by complete chance on holiday in Israel, Mark said the first thing he did on beginning it was to visit the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, to say his prayers. The procedure lasted an hour and 20 minutes, a procedure of indescribable pain, he says. More recently, Mark, with his partner Mandy, brought to a standstill a howling demonstration of a thousand hardline anti-Zionists waving Hezbollah flags in support of violent destruction of Israel. He used his wheelchair to block the pro-Iranian protest marking Al-Quds Day in central London. Mark later condemned the government for allowing the Al-Quds Day march to occur in the first place. And so it was in 2019 the new Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, banned the political wing of Hezbollah making these protests illegal. Shortly afterwards, Mark and Mandy announced enough was enough. They decided to begin a new life in Israel. And arriving at Ben-Gurion Airport, Mark declared his pessimism for the future of Jews in the UK and Europe. It felt very much like a homecoming. Um, wondering when I'm here, why it taken so long to get here. And what stopped you before? Everyone has an excuse not to make Aliyah, not to go to Israel to, to live. The kids are too young, the parents are too old, I'm too old, etc. I can't speak the language, I can't find a job. 
etc. The living standards aren't as good. But in fact, I've come out, I've enjoyed myself so far, and I really feel that this is a place that I need to be and I need to belong. And of course, I've now got to the stage where I don't feel guilty when someone's having Cabra's chocolate reserved for foreigners, <laughs> or reserved for Israelis, not for foreigners, that I can now take a piece legitimately and say, well, I'm one of the Israelis who can have some of this foreign food. You can have your chock and eat it. Correct. Let's talk about the idea of Cadbury's, of course, from my home city, and the idea of maintaining your Britishness, or at least your culture, uh, of, you know, having been, what, 50 years, a Mancunian, a Londoner, and now an Israeli. But the best one in the world, Mark, um, you can't be the Israeli that was born in Hulon, can you? I saw my uncle last week. Who, who's lived here for over 50 years. And he said to me something very good. He said for the first 18 years, he lived in Manchester and he was a Jew living in Manchester. And then he made Ali and he lived in Israel for the last 50 years and he's become an Anglo living in Israel. So there is always this element of being this English person who has emigrated and lives in Israel. And it says that you're not um, a Sabra, you're not born here. But it doesn't really matter. The, the relation, that, the relationship that you can have with, you know, the, the other people. I mean, everybody comes up and congratulates you, and when you tell them that you've made Aliyah, they say, "Oh, this is for welcome home, um, Mazel Tov, congratulations." It's very moving, isn't it? I mean, the discussions that I was having, Israelis not born in the country were almost of reinvention. Uh, a guy a little bit older than me was telling me, like so many, like I've heard from you, like I've heard from David Mensah and other people of our age, about, I wished I'd done it earlier, it's the best thing I've ever done, and someone told me that he reinvented himself. I didn't come here with a job, but I've got a job now, and my kids are here, and they speak Hebrew, and it, it was like as though he'd been born again, in a sense. There is, there is an element of feeling born again. There's also an element of feeling like there's a weight taken off your shoulders because you don't have to explain yourself to, that why you are Jewish or why you've been born in the, uh, being Jewish. You really do belong here. Now, let's talk about identity here because um, your Jewish identity was impacted severely in the UK, much to the shock and surprise of all of us who were born and grew up here, where being Jewish wasn't such a touch point. Mark, just kind of summarise the kind of things institutionally and personally that you experienced in your final couple of years in the UK? Well, I, I think it actually goes back a lot, a lot further, even from school days, that you were always the outsider, uh, and you did your best, and you tried to explain and argue as to, you know, why I am a British Jew, the British part of it came, came first. Uh, much like you learn about uh, 1930s Germany, where people were... Uh, um, Germans of the mosaic persuasion, they were German Jews. At the end of the day, you've always had, if you lived in Britain, somebody um, not accepting you as being a natural person. I mean, I remember, I think, you know, people have been talking about first anti Semitic experience, but in fact, there are many, many more. And I suppose the, all that's happened in recent years, when you're talking about the last couple of years, is the advent of social media and social media has made it more acceptable for people to say things to you that they wouldn't say to your face or not as many people would say to your face probably the biggest form of anti-semitism there there is are those people who even deny that there's anti-semitism they can't say and they would not say it to other people other minorities they would not say to ah but you are a black person complaining of racism and therefore there is something wrong you are not really black people don't experience racism it would be an outrageous thing to say but yet nobody has a problem of saying it to Jews and they identify Jews as their enemy whatever their enemy has to happens to be in late 2018 he was fined by the solicitors disciplinary tribunal for a small number of tweets in response to a three-year hate campaign against him. 
Mark was subjected to thousands of anti-Semitic messages from neo-Nazis, including death threats, and Mark had to increase his personal security because of it. Trolls marked Mark's MS, superimposed images of his face on photographs of a crematorium in Auschwitz, and other horrible stuff you get on Twitter. His attackers included Alison Shablo, who received a two-year suspended sentence in August 2018, convicted of posting grossly offensive songs mocking Jews who died in the Holocaust. But despite this, the tribunal found that Mark's response, a small number of these, merited a punishment and he was fined two and a half thousand quid and ordered to pay ten thousand more in costs. All this after the tribunal admitted they'd considered just a reprimand but decided against it. One of the panel was subsequently to have been found to have a history of making anti-Israel comments. His name? Milius Palaiwa. I was witness to the judgment and Mr Palaiwa made just one intervention that day asking Mark's counsel to confirm the precise year Jews were expelled from England. 1290 was the answer, a moment at which the tribunal seemed to stretch over into the realms of an inquisition, a sort of Dreyfus case. Mark, where has this rise in anti-Semitism come from? Because though social media magnifies it, there is something else at play here. Uh, what is happening in the UK? And will it last? Is it getting worse? Is the genie out of the bottle? Well, I think the genie is out of the bottle. But remember, anti-Semitism is the oldest hatred. And every generation, when we say at Passover and the Seder, every generation people are, are coming to get us. And it's actually the fact that there is every generation, it comes forward. It doesn't really matter whether it comes from the left or from the right. There is something that gets hold of people and it becomes acceptable. And you see, at the moment, you see so many people on the left, the extreme left of the Labour Party, and they are identifying Jews as being the enemy and as because their enemy are the capitalists they're saying oh well the Jews are synonymous with the capitalists and they are bad people they are the bosses they are the oppressors and if they complain it's because it's some sort of cheating thing because they don't want um, a Corbyn government they don't want these things to happen uh, because they're our enemy the Jewish population of Europe is less than a million. When you consider the Jewish population in 1935 was six million, there really is no future demographically for Jews, isn't there? And that might not necessarily be alone down to anti-Semitism. It's more down to the strength of the state of Israel, isn't it? Because as the American and Canadian populations decline or become assimilatory, as the Democrats take their hold in American politics in a way hitherto that they hadn't before, Israel seems so much more of a progressive society with a small p against the problems that Jews are having in Britain, Belgium, France. Well, I think we've seen in our, in our lifetime, you know, that it used to be that Israel needed the diaspora, Israel needed the communities of Britain and America and France, etc. And it's, it's turned round. It's now that the communities in Britain and France and America need Israel. And we need somewhere to go to. I mean, I, I, I remember thinking, you know, why didn't the... You know, why didn't people leave? And then you suddenly saw the former Soviet Union and people wanted to leave and you're campaigning for that, for people to get out. And then you're campaigning for people and helping people get out of Ethiopia to live in Israel. And then you think 10 years ago, you're seeing people in France having to go to Israel. And all of a sudden... It's in Britain, and it's you know I'm not I'm not going to be the last. There's a lot of people who will be coming and living here. I have a theory about this tipping point where the diaspora supported Israel, and now that Israel supports the diaspora, it came at the credit crunch in 2008, because um, Israel was one of a handful of countries that didn't suffer from the credit crunch. Uh, Norway and Canada are two other examples, while the principal countries of the West didn't just have their trousers pulled down, but also the scope of their politics changed at that moment as well. I mean, it might be so, but that's that's one of the things with anti-Semitism. When you say when it has, has arisen, it's also arisen at the times historically when there have been economic crashes. So economic crashes in the 1930s, 
32, the Great Depression, followed shortly after by um, you know the worst period for Jews in, the, in Europe, the absolute decimation, the Holocaust. Mark, no one can be failed to be moved by your arrival in Israel, which was covered on uh, Israeli television and world television, when I mean, you and Mandy came through Ben-Gurion duty-free to be welcomed uh, by family and friends with Israeli flags, and uh, it was a moment of great elation and joy. And some of the things that you said were extremely direct. They were almost pulled from the words of Douglas Murray's book on Islam, identity and the future of Europe. Mark, is it as stark as that? Is it the end of Europe for Jewish people or were you just relieved to be in Israel? No, I, I, look, looking at it, I think the end, the end has arrived. I mean, people, people will look back and say when was the period now of course there are people who are saying we're staying to fight i query whether what what they what they're going to fight and how they're going to fight but they're staying in britain in order to fight and to to survive but i don't think it's going to get any better for them the demographics of europe have changed and the jewish population of britain is a min- you know is a minority the, the thing i was I went to the Bevis Mark Synagogue about a year ago, and it's the oldest congregation in Europe. And, and the rabbi was making um, a speech to explain how the Jews had come into the country in 1670, 1680. A very interesting, very interesting story. But the point that stood out to me was that the Jews there had come into the country and got rights in the 1800s had not been here that long compared to the previous time when they'd been expelled from the country. They were expelled in 1190, coming back nearly 500 years later. They haven't been in the country for 500 years. And they're already leaving. It's only a temporary wandering. We are the wandering people is what, what I said when I got off the plane. I didn't... Look, my great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents came from the, you know, Eastern Europe, Poland and Russia to, to England. And I would have said, in, if you'd have asked me, in 1970s or 1980s, the Jewish population will be here in England for good. Now I'm looking at it thinking, I can't believe, but 120 years later, and it's time to go again. It's time to move on. What has happened? Is it mass immigration? Has the consensus of the, of the country changed so rapidly in the last 15 years as to change the norms of what we thought British society was? I, I honestly don't know, and, I, and, I, and I'm anxious not to say, oh, I blame it all on immigrants and immigration. I think government policy, I think that the services that are available uh, and perhaps the outlook of of the country, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling a squeeze, but the things are, you know, politicians have been playing with people that are trying to, trying to deal with things. I suppose if you were... Looking at one issue, 120 years ago, when people arrived in Britain, when Jews were arriving in Britain in the 1890s, they were having eggs thrown at them, and and newspapers were writing saying this immigration of these Jews is a terrible thing. So there has always been an element of not wanting the outsider, whether there are more recent... um, Caribbean, uh, Afro-Caribbean, whether they're Asian people who are arriving, there has been a hostility that um, is, you know, incredibly unfair. But there's also a difference. And the difference politically is this, is that whereas there had previously been an effort to assimilate people and to make them learn the English language, etc., now we have an element of multiculturalism where... Well, I say we, where, where Britain is saying, look, actually, you don't need to learn the English language. You don't need to do this. We will put science up in every language in hospitals. We will do leaflets in every language. We will try and accommodate you. Now, I'm sure that's being done with the best one in the world, and the people who are receiving it have it in the best one of the world. 
but at the same time it doesn't help assimilation and I think you've got to be very careful that sometimes the character of a country has to change and it's good that it changes but with that change there can be other things that come with it. To the future and you've made Aliyah and like so many men of our age what are you going to do? Can you translate your uh, skill set to an English law firm in Israel? Well, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be an Israeli lawyer. My Hebrew is never going to be at the um, level required to be a lawyer in this country. But there are many things that I can do. Whether practicing law um, from here in England, which is still, I, I still have clients. They still want advice, and um, telephone lines and computers exist, and airplanes to fly you to to court hearings, but there are so many other things to do as well in terms of, you know, being able to speak, being able to get around. My biggest handicap is not linguistic or or anything, or not even my age. My biggest handicap is being a disabled person, uh, you know, wherever in the world. That, um, it makes it more difficult, but it also makes it a challenge. One of the most incredible television documentaries I saw over the last few years was your near total recovery through groundbreaking injections I think at the Hadassah hospital in Jerusalem related to MS is this part of the idea being closer to the potential for a recovery from okay MS? so let me, let me tell you about a good thing right in terms of because one of the things people talk about is the nhs is you know a, a wonderful system there is a health system in israel as soon as a new immigrant arrives they automatically get health insurance i have the best health insurance that i could get anywhere in the world at a fraction of the cost of what it would, was costing me in england whether by national insurance or whether any private private top up in terms of the stem cell treatment that I had at Hadassah, doctors in the National Hospital in London said when they saw the level of my recovery at that time, do you think we can send all our patients to Israel? Because it was that much better. I just want to ask you about the metaphor to what you've just discussed here, which is that, that there's a real sense of purpose about the society. There's a great deal of health about the incoming immigration. There's a great deal of purpose about the existing population. I think it's, what, near 9 million now. And an idea that things are really working. You know, there are obviously massive problems. But Israel seems to fix them in a way that Europe doesn't. The sense of purpose in Israel is actually making for a successful country while Europe lags behind. Well, well I think there is a certain attitude of can do, can fix, and looking at a problem and trying to solve it. An amazing ability of people to get on with each other, uh, to work together and live together. What, what always amuses me is, is because seeing people wearing hijabs being served by Jewish waiters in restaurants and thinking, well, this is completely opposite way of the perception <laughs> yeah. of, of, of people saying, oh, well, you know, you know, this is an apartheid system. When you see it in reality, it's absolutely nothing like it. Mark Lewis. Well, that's it for today. Don't forget the new State Solution podcast also on this feed. And thank you for giving generously via patreon.com slash Johnny Gould. See you soon.